So tonight marks our second first Wednesday lecture of our 10th season. Can you comprehend that? Second first Wednesday lecture of our 10th season. And I'm happy to bring a new face and topic in front of you, Dr. Paul Whalen of Dartmouth College, who will speak about face-to-face -face with the emotional brain. And you'll learn a new word tonight. I, I did, and also I'm stum stumbling over it. Amygdala. Amygdala. And he will uh, explain what that means. And um, I say this every time, we're so fortunate to have the Vermont Humanities Council in this state to sponsor lectures. And of course, our fundraising arm of the library, the Friends of the Library, they're getting the local support. And they are uh, raising funds uh, this week. Uh, we have on Friday night at 7 p.m., uh, Tony Barrand and Keith Murphy will be here to sing songs from Coldbrook, which is um, this uh, small this location in Westover where these great uh, folk songs of Vermont come from and uh, tickets are ten dollars and they're available at the front desk so uh, encourage you to buy them because I think they will sell out I'd like to recognize our other sponsors who have given generously with funds for to support these programs Brattleboro Cam Camera Club, Brattleboro Retreat, Brattleboro Savings Alone, Downs Rackland Martin, New Chapter and the Wyndham World Affairs Council and the statewide sponsors for First Wednesdays are the National Life Group Foundation and the Vermont Department of Libraries. And finally, uh, thanks to the underwriter for this lecture, Chroma Technology of Rockingham, Vermont. And please remember to take home a flyer tonight for next month's talk, which will be December 2nd. Middlebury uh, Professor Glenn Andrews will be here to talk to about the buildings of Vermont. So, uh, Paul Whalen is a professor of psychological and brain sciences at Dartmouth College. Dr. Whalen received his PhD from the University of Vermont and subsequently was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School where, where he learned functional brain imaging using functional magnetic resonance imaging. Dr. Whalen now teaches and runs a brain imaging laboratory that focuses on the story, the study of emotion and emotional disorders. He co-edited the book, The Human Amygdala, and his work has been featured in the New York Times, and he is president-elect of the Social and Effective Neuroscience Society. His lab website can be found at www.whalenlab.info, in case you want to look it up afterwards. Uh, Dr. Whalen uses brain imaging to study emotions. Specifically, Dr. Whalen will, Whalen will present data in health subjects and subjects with anxiety disorders, showing how the brain processes normal emotional situations and how this processing goes awry in emotional disorders. His talk will provide you with a new way to think about your own emotional life and what exactly is happening between your ears when you succeed or fail at emotional regulation, which we all do from time to time. So please welcome Dr. Paul Whalen. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming out. Um, Thank you for this headset, it's lovely. If this science thung thing doesn't work out for me, I can get a job now at McDonald's, or, or I could be a backup singer for Madonna, maybe. Uh, I grew up in, Summer in Somerville, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. Um, I live in Tunbridge now. That's Tunbridge, Vermont. That's Tunbridge, Vermont. That's what it usually looks like. <laughs> If you want to come visit, plan accordingly. Uh, this is my lab. These are my kids. These are the people who do all the work I'm going to present today. I'm going to take all the credit that they actually did this all. These the kids on the left are working on their PhDs right now. The kids on the right have their PhDs and they're off teaching in other places. So that's a brain facing that way. And this is the area of the brain that I study. It's called the amygdala. Um, I care so much about this brain area. If you do decide to go to my website after our little discussion today, um, you will have to find it to get in to the site, or we don't, we're, not, we're, not, we're not interested in talking to you. Okay? And what you're going to find when you go in there is that there's lots of things you could talk about in the brain, and we have labels for different parts of the brain that helps us communicate um, what this area might do. This one thing, another area might do, have another function. And while these labels work really well in most laboratories, um, my laboratory is a little different, okay? <laughs> we, 
tend to be a little bit focused on this one brain area. And by the end of the day, I, 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 at the end of the talk, I hope I can convince you that it's not a bad strategy. But at least now you know my biases, okay? I actually started uh, working with, with animals, and so my subjects were rabbits. And now my subjects are college students. And I put them in a, something that looks like this. This is an MRI scanner. How many people have been in one? Do you have fun in there? No. Most people describe it, as, describe it as a neutral to negative experience. You're confined, you're on your back. No one likes to be put on their back. No one likes to be shoved in a dark tube after we put you on your back. And it's quite loud in there, isn't it? That's because it's magnetic resonance. We have to make you resonate, okay? So all this is is a big magnet. That's all it is. But it turns out if we put you in a big magnet, we can get some of the particles in your body, the hydrogen, to line up with the magnetic field. And then if we bounce sound off you, just like standing in front of the speakers at a concert, we can actually feel the sound hitting your body. That's all we're doing, is we're shaking the hydrogen particles, and we know what speed they shake at. And we can measure that, and it turns out that that technology won't give you a picture that looks like this, because that's an x-ray, and those are dangerous, because you're passing radiation through the body. But an MRI, it's just a magnet, and it's actually very safe. You can, have one, you can do this every day if you want. <laughs> so it just turns out that the di different tissues in your body, the hydrogen moves at different speeds and we can, we can image that, we can just give it a different number and see that. So it turns out, you may know, in the brain you have gray matter, that's where the, that, those are the neurons, those, that's the cell bodies, and you, know, you probably know you have white matter, that's the axons, that's the connections. And you, you also know you have cerebral spinal fluid, which ends up being very dark in our scans. So it's, it's just, we're just lucky that this is gray, this is white, and this is black. The hydrogen in those three tissues is moving at a slightly different speed, and we can just make, tell the computer, Give this a five, give that a seven, give that a two, and boom, it's like a big, happy magnetic accident. We can see inside you, okay? So it's non-invasive, it's not dangerous. One way I want you to think about the brain is all your sensory information, much of it is coming from the back end. So you, what you're seeing right now is, is starting here and moving forward. What you're hearing right now is starting here and moving forward. It's, if, if you're touching the person next to you, I don't know why you would be doing that, but if you were, that information will be moving forward. You move it forward because this is your prefrontal cortex. Whatever decisions you're going to make based on what you're seeing and hearing, they're going to get made here. Whatever makes, I don't know what makes you interesting or uninteresting, but I know whatever it is, it lives here in the prefrontal cortex. Okay? This is what makes you human. And so it's all about us, the decisions we're going to make at the end of the day, and you're going to find out that the prefrontal cortex is very important in the decisions that we make and when we regulate efficiently. But what I, what I need you to know is, in addition to the cortex, the outer layer, you have a whole world down there in the middle. You have these structures that we call the limbic system, that we know have something to do with the processing of emotion, and we know amygdala is one of them. So I'm going to tell you a lot today about the amygdala and about how prefrontal cortex attempts to control it. What you need to understand about amygdala is you don't get a big say in what amygdala does. Amygdala works automatically. Okay? That's what I'm going to try to convince you of. And once you know you're built that way, once you know that there are areas of your brain trying to protect you and reacting to what's going on in the environment without your permission, and they have, they're connected up with your heart rate and your respiration, they can begin to move your body around before you've even realized that that's happening to you. Okay? And then the whole deal then would be, once you realize that's happening, can you catch up with that and can you bring yourself back down to baseline? Okay? So I'm going to try to convince you then that you have two brains. You have an explicit brain, a brain, a voluntary brain, the brain that is doing whatever you're doing when you're talking to yourself, when you're aware of behaving. That's your cortex. But you have an implicit brain with an eye. You have an automatic brain, okay? You have two brains. I can prove that to you by introducing you to this guy who has... The left side of his face is paralyzed. He can't move the muscles on the left side of his face. He's being asked to smile right now, and he's trying to turn up both corners of his mouth, but he can't move the left side of his face. Now, you probably know that the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body, so you, must, you probably know then that there are motor neurons over here, and there are, that are trying to move the, face, the muscles of his face, but he must have a lesion here, okay? That's pro that, that is what his problem is. He has a, a motor cortex lesion, and he can't move the left side of his face. Unless I crack a hilarious joke. If he thinks it's funny, he's cured. He can move those muscles fine. He just can't move them voluntarily. That tells you that you have two motor cortexes. You have an explicit motor cortex when you try to move, and you have an implicit automatic motor cortex 
well, it's not a motor cortex. It sits in the middle of your brain. It's called the striatum. This is where you store your automatic motor programs. Do you know what that means? Anything you've practiced a thousand times now lives here. You started with your cortex, but then you move things. It's efficient. Think about when you drive a car now. Think about when you drove a car during your driving test when you were 16. 16, very equipal, very cortical, right? Then you got practiced. How do you drive now? I just drove down here from Dartmouth on the highway. <laughs> right? And then all, all of a sudden, every now and then, you come back to the wheel and you go, who's been driving the car for the last nine and a half minutes? And you have this vague memory of a left turn and a right turn, but you weren't doing that explicitly. Your striatum does that for you now. Okay, it's efficient. So I'm giving you that motor example because I'm going to now try to convince you that this is how amygdala is working. In an emotional sense, amygdala can do automatic responding in, to emotional situations, and you're not always going to be privy to that conversation. It's going to start without you sometimes. So, amygdala, ready? A little anatomy. Brain's facing this way. Now I'm just going to slice through the brain this way and turn the brain towards you. Okay? You actually have two of them. It's one here and one here. Anybody know what the word means? It's Greek. It means almond. Yeah. So we name things in the brain for often what, what they're shaped like. So amygdala ends up being shaped like almonds. So you can see now the, the two almond-shaped structures. That's your amygdala. If I show you one final picture, just to make it clear, it's a 3D picture where I take the cake, cake slice out of the head. You can see the left amygdala. You can see the prefrontal cortex. You can't see the right amygdala because the cortex is blocking your view. Okay? So what do I use to study this structure? Well, what amygdala does for you is it's, if anything bad has ever happened to you, what amygdala immediately does is it backs track in time and says, what could we have been aware of that would have predicted that for us until we could have avoided that? Okay? So it's looking, it, some people will tell you this is the fear center of your brain. It's not accurate. It, it's the, the center of your brain that's trying to learn about what could have predicted things that make you afraid. It, so it's a learning area first. Okay? The things it learns about often make you emotional, often make you afraid, but amygdala is trying to protect you from that. So if you get out of this one situation, next time maybe we can avoid it better. So all I had to do then, as I'm putting human subjects in brain scanners now, if I want to activate the amygdala, I just have to think of a cue, a signal out there in our world, in our social world, that we use all the time to predict what's going to happen next. And that's faces, right? You use faces because they're a canvas. You can move the signal around on faces. That predicted something very different for you the last time that you saw that compared to that. So you use these to predict what's going to happen next in your social life. This is probably a uniquely human ability because we all know animals don't have facial expressions, <laughs> right? I've named him Popeye. So animals can do this too, okay? You can take sheep and just show them pictures of other sheep, and when you show them this one, their little heart rates go crazy, okay? So animals use the faces of other animals just like we do. So really what's important about this in, in the human condition is that these are exemplars. They're universal. You can go just about anywhere in the world, and if you ask for fear, you get something that looks like that. And if you ask for happy, you get something that looks like that. And you never see an exception to this rule, ever. Okay? Not going to happen. Sorry. Can you resist? Hey, I give talks. I'm leaving you. I'm going right to Logan. I have to go give a talk in Vancouver. So I give talks all over the world. And so when I'm in Texas, I bring this slide. Okay? <laughs> because in Texas, you can carry a concealed weapon legally. But... <laughs> all right. So, facial expression. We, we, we're going to center on when other people look afraid. What does your brain do when someone else, standing right in front of you, suddenly looks afraid? Okay? So you take individuals, you put them in a brain scanner, you have fearful faces flashing on the screen, men, women, all different ages if you want, and what the brain scan tells you is that there's one area of the brain that really cares about when someone else looks afraid, and that's the amygdala, right? So now there's a color on the amygdala, this is called functional MRI. So I told you about MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, 
This is functional MRI. It means that while I'm watching the structure of the brain, I can use the same shaking hydrogen particles and just color code them because when you suck oxygen out of the blood supply in a brain area, the hydrogen moves differently there. And we can see that. It's the same principle. And then we just color it. If a lot of oxygen gets taken out, we color it yellow. If a medium amount gets taken out, we color it red. If a little bit gets taken out, we color it blue. So this is telling you that this is an average of 20 humans lying in a scanner watching that, flashing, ma males, females, repeated fear faces. And amygdala tells you, I really care about that signal. Now, remember the, the boy who can't move the left side of his face, and remember that that's an automatic motor program, and I want you to believe that amygdala is an automatic a motion detector, okay? It's doing this without your permission. People are li these people are lying in the scanner seeing these faces, and they probably are talking to themselves. There's a, there's a afraid face, there's a happy face, there's an afraid face. And so what I want to know is, is this amygdala detecting the fear face and telling the brain? That's what I want you to believe. But it could also be the cortex, the person talking to themselves, there's, there's an afraid face. So I had to figure out a way to show you fear faces, but you have no idea that you've just seen one. And the way you do that is it's called backward masking. All you do is you throw a fear face up on the screen for a very short amount of time. That's 17 milliseconds. Okay, that's one refresh rate on an LCD screen. That's incredibly fast. That's not even the magic part, though. What you have to do then is you have to have the next frame. If you think of this as a film strip, the next frame, the next thing on the screen has to be the neutral face of another person. And if you do that, and, and that has to stay up longer, 183 milliseconds. That whole event is going to happen very quickly. It's going to just look like a flash to you. You're, going, you're not really going to know what happened. And then when I ask you, what did you just see? You're going to say, I saw her. And you're not going to be able to report to me that I, your retina just got a fear face and thus your brain just got a fear face. But your amygdala knows they're there. Okay? So it is implicit. This is amygdala detecting the fear face and telling the rest of the brain about it. And you're not even involved in the conversation at the 200 millisecond mark. Okay? That tells you that your amygdala is doing this right now. It's monitoring the environment for important signals that have predicted important social outcomes for you. And it does it all the time. Okay? So that tells you that sometimes your amygdala is going to... Look, think about how complex this visual scene is right now. You can't... All of this is hitting your retina. But you can't pay attention to all of it. So stuff's going to get through without your permission. You know, panic disorder is a disorder where someone has panic attacks, and oftentimes they can tell you about their trigger. They can say, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't get on crowded buses, because last time I got on a crowded bus, I <laughs> so I don't get on crowded buses. But the disorder is defined by also having spontaneous panic attacks, where they can't tell you about the trigger. These data suggest that that, that, that might not be the case, that it might not be that there isn't a trigger, it's that they can't tell you what the trigger is, that it's out there somewhere, okay? that there may be no such thing as a spontaneous panic attack. Well, the next question we had to answer was, um, how can amygdala do this? <laughs> That's a very complex image. And, it, and amygdala is discriminating it from happy faces in 17 milliseconds. Amygdala is not that bright. It's really not. So how could it possibly be doing this really exquisite discrimination so quickly? And what we decided was it probably isn't. It probably can't. It's probably using a portion of this information as a proxy for the presence of the whole face. So the next experiment we ran is we just got rid of everything but the eyes and took a shot that this is, this is the important signal. It's the widening of the sclera. And that amygdala is actually telling the difference between that and, um, and happy eye whites. So this, again, this is backward masking, so you're not going to see this, right? If you did, you'd be telling me about Scooby-Doo closets or something, right? And I don't want you to do that. I want you to only be able to tell me that you saw her and you run the same experiment and you get the exact same result. Okay? So... Amygdala is very good at this. This signal is very potent. Again, I think it's learned. It means that when you show amygdala the whole face, it's really just looking at this. It's picking up on the, the, the change in the, the, the size of the eyes. I assume this is a learned response. I don't know that. It's possible. We all came into the world with this ability. It was hardwired. Okay? Um, the only way to answer that question, and I could do it. My wife runs a newborn nursery at Darwin Hitchcock Medical Center. We can start hiding out and wait in, de in delivery rooms, <laughs> grabbing babies and covering their eyes before any they see a face, and throwing them in an MRI scanner. Okay, we could do this, but nobody's <laughs> volunteering for that study. Um, so, 
I'll never know the answer to that question. I assume this is learning. I assume the human brain learning trumps everything eventually. But I don't know that. What it is is it's interesting and it's potent. Um, and it's a very strong um, activator of amygdala. You won't be able to see this slide maybe, but amygdala can do some really, like, really good, dis uh, strong discriminations. Um, it can pick up on very subtle differences. So I don't know if you can see, but her pupils are bigger here than they are here. If you mix these all up, so, you won't, so your subjects only ever get one version of this, and then have the faces flashing where the pupil size is changing, A, no one picks up on that's the thing, and B, amygdala is much more activated by large pupils than it is by small pupils. And that's because pupil dilation, when someone does that in, in close proximity to you, is a, is a lot like eye widening. It means they become interested in something, and they're learning, and you, if you're that close to them, you should probably figure out what that is. Maybe it's you, right? Um, our subjects were also all males here for this first study, and the reason we did that is uh, pupil dilation is also associated with something else historically in psychology. Anybody know? Right. Attractiveness, right? So, uh, you know where that started, right? In Victorian era, women used to put belladonna in their eyes to, to, right before the ball to dilate their pupils, right? You know this? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a great strategy, except for if you've ever gotten the eye drops at the doctor's office. You can't see anything when you dilate your pupils. Okay? Which explains why in Victorian photographs a lot of really pretty women standing, standing next to some really ugly guys. Okay? That's, that's what you get for cheating. So amygdala uh, can, can do something as subtle as pupil dilation as well. So eye widening, pupil dilation, little crude rules amygdala can use to know something significant and social and potentially predictive is going on in, in my immediate environment. Well, fear's all well and, and good, but you, he knows something you don't know, but there's one thing you do know, whatever's happening is negative, okay? It's not a good thing. Well, what about this expression, right? Is a car coming at her, or did she just walk in on her birthday party, right? You need not lean in a more negative or more positive way, but we all do. If I give you 100 of these, 50 males and 50 females, and give you two buttons, positive or negative, and make you choose how many times are you going to hit the negative button. That's what I study. I study negativity bias. And what happens when I show you surprise faces in a brain scanner? Well, it looks like this. You now have the prefrontal cortex involved, because unlike fear, a decision needs to be made here. There's two choices now. So you're going to need, amygdala's going to need some help. If you look at that face and assume something negative is happening to her, then what I see is a large signal in the amygdala in you, okay? And that fits perfectly well with the fear faces and the backward masking and everything I've told you, right? Amygdala's trying to protect you. And what happens is amygdala sends a signal to prefrontal saying, those are widened eyes, that could be trouble. But others of you, those of you who are pushing the positive button more often, you get that same negativity message out of amygdala, I promise you, in the first 200 milliseconds. But your prefrontal cortex takes that same message, works with it, reverses it, maybe based on memories or past experiences, and turns it around, calms amygdala down, and then you press the positive button. So that's exactly how we run these studies. You're going to see one face at a time. So the faces will either be angry, happy, or surprised. See, I think I know which button you're going to push here, and I think I know which button you're going to push here. What I want to know is how many times you're going to push the negative button. For the, for the surprise faces. And then I can graph you. I can have a graph for angry, surprised, and happy. And this is percent negative ratings. This is the number of times you hit the negative button. So every symbol is going to be a person. If you're up here, you're pushing the negative button a lot. And if you're down here, you're pushing the happy button a lot. So the whole group is on top of each other in agreement that the angry faces are negative. The same people are equally convinced that the happy faces are positive. What do these same people do with surprise? You guys spread out, right? You have people who are 90% sure something negative is happening with those surprise faces. And other people who are 90% sure something positive is happening with those surprise faces. And then you have an interesting group. You have the fence sitters, right? The 50-50 here in the middle. What I can also measure when, in addition to which button you're choosing, is I can measure how long it takes you to push the button. It takes you less than a second to tell me anger is negative. It takes you less than a second for you to tell me that happy is positive. Th th those are easy questions. It takes you longer to tell me that surprise is whatever you choose, okay? That's because you're making a choice. That makes sense. But that's not the kicker. Here's the kicker. In here are negative button presses and positive button presses. So if I separate those out, 
It takes you 900 milliseconds to tell me surprise is negative. It takes you 1,400 milliseconds to tell me that surprise is positive. Optimism takes effort. In order to see things in a more positive light, you have to work at this. And what you have to do, the reason that is, remember what I said, amygdala sends out a negativity message on every trial. If you agree and push a negative button, you're going to push it faster. If you have to do some work and turn that around, that's going to take a little bit longer. How much longer? It's about 300 milliseconds. You've got 300 milliseconds. You can do that. Okay? You can actually, you, this is what we do in, this is the game here. If, if anxiety is going to be about an amygdala that's intruding on the cortex too often, then that's what it is. And it's, the game is going to be the, the ability of the prefrontal cortex to kind of keep that in, in check so you can see things in a more positive light. Then the whole game is going to be how good are you at recruiting this area of the brain. And some of us are better than others. Okay? I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. So that's when your amygdala is assuming something negative is happening to us, and then prefrontal has to offer it another opinion. Hey, well, what about positivity? But what about this situation? Same game, you have two buttons, positive and negative. This face comes up, which button are you going to push? Positive, sure. Why wouldn't, what reason on earth would you have to push anything but positive? <laughs> right? So it goes the other way, too. Your brain gambles, okay? 97% of the time, that is positive. And your brain will start down that alley. But if prefrontal cortex, because amygdala can't read, kids, gets some information that this person is not our friend, you're going to have to be able to reverse that the other way, okay? So this same system can do that as well. So let's talk about anxiety, then, if, if the game's going to be the ability of prefrontal. In, so there are going to be connections from prefrontal to amygdala and the, and the other way, okay? Amygdala has to be able to tell prefrontal when, when we might be in trouble. That's pretty much all amygdala does, by the way. It, when it sees the eye whites, it just goes, there, there they are again, do something. That's it. That's probably the extent of the message. Then prefrontal makes decisions. So amygdala is not your fight-or-flight area. Prefrontal is, because fighting or f fleeing is a complicated decision. Okay? You're not going to leave that up to amygdala. <laughs> so... There are connections between amygdala and prefrontal. They are not blue. They do not have arrowheads at the end of them. Um, this is what they look like, even though I've colored them blue. This is now a brain facing you this way, and the cake slice goes down and then forward. Okay? So you can't really see amygdala. It's buried right behind the blue here. But this is the bottom of your prefrontal cortex, and these are projections coming from amygdala to prefrontal and back. Okay? That's what they look like when we image them. This is a different type of imaging called DTI. So what we're actually doing here, this, this isn't a brain activation. This is white matter. These are axons. These are the connections coming from cell bodies and amygdala and, and landing in your prefrontal and, and back the other way. What's this D Diffusion. So DTI is diffusion tensor imaging. So really it's the movement of water. So water is diffusing across all the cells of your body right now. And because the axons are myelinated, when water bumps up against them, it, it runs along the track, and, we, and it, it changes its speed, and we can measure that. We can, we, can, we can measure the rate of diffusion along an axon. Okay? And where's the corpus callosum in that picture? In this, in this, you can't see it in that picture. So that picture, basically, corpus callosum would be right here, okay. and it, we basically cut it out, and you're, you're, you're below it. So you're, you're, the, those tracks are ending up right here, in the bottom of the prefrontal cortex. But the key is, though, this is a group average, but if I took this map for each one of you in this room, the thickness of this would be different for everybody in the room. Some of us have stronger connections between prefrontal and amygdala, so some of us differ in the hardware that we're walking around with. Not only in our ability to utilize this, but how well the two are hooked up in the first place. Okay? Because I can show you a graph where this is the measure of how thick your connection is. It's called FA, don't worry about that. Higher numbers mean you, you have stronger connections between prefrontal and amygdala. Those people have lower trade anxiety. The people who have a weak connection with prefrontal and, and amygdala, when they fill out a trade anxiety scale, they tell us they're very jumpy on a daily basis. So the thickness of the cable matters. And again, this is 20-year-old kids, so it raises a, an, an amazing chicken and egg question. Were we all born with different strengths in these connections, and that those are the cards we're dealt, and you just have to deal with that? And you're, some of you are going to have to work harder to regulate because you don't have a strong connection? Or were we all born with very similar strengths of connectivity between these two, and then stuff happened to us? 
Some of us experienced trauma, and some of us didn't. Some of us were taught to regulate, and some of us weren't. So if that's the case, then if I'm measuring differences in the thickness of the connections at age 20, it means experience changed the, the white matter. It changed the actual structural connections, which is pretty cool. So that is a good thing, because I believe experiences can change the brain. If that's true, then experiences should be able to change it back. So guess what we have these kids doing now? We're going to keep following them, and we're having them come in once a week. We have four groups. We have a meditation group. We have a cognitive behavioral therapy group. That's talk therapy, where you teach people to, to think differently about what's happening to them in their lives. Basically, you're teaching them how to use their prefrontal cortex. We have a physical exercise group and a music group. That is, people get to come in and they can listen to any music they want. They come in once a week, and every three months, we're going to measure their cables again. We're going to see if we're, changing, if we're thickening, thickening up connections between prefrontal and amygdala. Okay? So I'll report back on that in a year or so. Imagine if you cut these connections. Imagine if something happened and you actually severed that, that connection. And now you've got an amygdala that's running amok, working quite automatically, and a prefrontal cortex that might be able to accomplish a couple of things because it's not damaged, but it has no connection to go and inhibit amygdala and calm it down. Well, that's not an idle circumstance because that actually happened to this guy in 1848. Who's this? This is Phineas Gage. This is what happened to Phineas Gage. That's, that's not an actual picture of him. It couldn't be, because that's what he looked like after the accident, right? And you all know the story? Cavendish, Vermont? Okay, here we go. Ready? First of all, what, one thing, I know for, for a lot of us, you hear this story ad nauseum, so I'll try to make it quick, but there's a few things, you know, people forget. He was 24 years of age. He was a pretty good-looking guy. And he's the foreman of the railroad. So this guy's like an eligible bachelor, okay? And he's got the best job in town. He's the most responsible guy in town. And what happens is he works where you have to blast with gunpowder, and that's a tamping iron that you hold up here on the tapered end. The tapered end ends up being very important to the story. Phineas doesn't live unless this end's tapered. This thing's three and a half feet long, and it's iron. And what you do is you pack gunpowder down in a hole and you tamp down on it with a big metal rod. So you have to be very careful not to cause a spark. So what you do is you put sand on top of the gunpowder. So there's a sand boy in this story, a kid who's supposed to be running around putting sand on top after the powder set. Well, a fight broke out. Phineas was the foreman. He went and broke up the fight, thought the sand had been laid down, had been laid down. It had not. He tapped once, and this thing entered behind his left eye and shot through his head and shot, came, out the, came out of the top of his head. And he lived. Long before Harry Potter, he was the original boy who lived. Okay? And they made a freak out of him. We have this picture, which is found in a basement in Lowell, because he was traveling. You go to get to go see the boy who lived and see the tamping iron and, and hear the story. But what happened to Phineas is he lost his job. He became very irresponsible. He became um, violent and uh, couldn't control any, any of his emotions. And what we think happened, we can never know, is when this tamping iron went through, it severed these connections. So now you have an amygdala running amok and, and a prefrontal cortex that doesn't have a prayer of keeping it under control. So a guy who never swore in public before, now suddenly that's all you heard out of him. So this is just me playing with Photoshop, okay? That's the original picture, and this is me just trying to get an idea of what he looked like by throwing, throwing this eye over here. So that's Cavendish, Vermont. If you don't know the story, read up on it. He, he grew up in Lebanon, New Hampshire. He lost his job on the, on the railroad but he was hired by the Hampton Inn right after that. Apparently he was good enough for the Hampton Inn after his in injury. So we think about emotional disorders. So we've been talking about anxiety. So far I've only told you about, when I show you those 20 kids and tell you if you have a thicker connection with the prefrontal cortex, you're, le you're, you're less anxious. Well, that's variability in, 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 in a healthy group of participants. These, when I haven't gotten to people yet who are reporting uh, that in and being diagnosed with, a, with an anxiety disorder. I also work with patients. Uh, and one of the patient groups I work with at Mass General is post-traumatic stress disorder. And you can do something as simple. So and if I have another take-home for today, it's we've been able to learn quite a bit from these simple facial expressions. Just take a group of patients and show their brain this and see what happens. And what you find is you can measure... So what's happened... This is, this is how much they're recruiting their prefrontal cortex, okay? 
So what this is, is this is a map saying that this group of people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, it's blue because they're not activating their prefrontal cortex well, okay? So they're lower than healthy participants in, in, as a group. But what this graph is telling you is now go into just the patients. Every dot here is a person with PTSD, okay? This is their symptom severity. These people are very sick. These people have PTSD, but they're less, they're, they're doing better. They're, they're coping better. Here, any dot that's higher is someone who, even though they were lower than healthy participants, was able to activate their prefrontal cortex to some degree. Okay? So you're getting people here who can kind of do it, people who, eh, and then these people can't activate it at all. What that tells you is, that if you can just get some of this, you get some relief. These people are less sick because they have a lower symptom score. So if you can just get, even if, if you have a disorder, to the degree that you can practice recruiting your prefrontal cortex in times of stress, uh, su suggests you're going to be, have less symptoms anyway. That's what that graph tells you. Okay, so in the sense of being very important even for individuals with disorders. So the expressions are, are fun. I, I hope I, you, you've seen, we've learned a few things from using fearful faces, learned a few things from using surprise faces. But amygdala can, needs to learn you know, anything social, and so you don't even have to use expression, right? We have to learn about each other, too. There are individuals who you want to approach and individuals that you want to avoid, right? The hallways at work are only so wide. And some days, just not in the mood to walk by this person, okay? And that's because some people aren't very nice to us, right? Some people are mean to us, and you have to learn the identity of that. So can I do something as silly as show you her picture and have her insult you six times? She's going to say you're ugly. She's going to say you're stupid. I think the meanest one on this list is she likes everyone but you. Okay. <laughs> then I'm going to introduce you to this woman. She's going to tell you you're pretty. She's going to tell you you're interesting. Um, and she's going to compliment you six times. And then we have a neutral person who's going to say things that are self-relevant about you. We're actually typing in the color of your clothing as you're coming in. Um, but they're not valence. They're not positive or negative. And the simple question is, look, you're never going to meet these people. And then after I train you up on the, on the 18 sentences, six neutral, six positive, then I just show you the faces while you're in a brain scan. Will amygdala care? You're never going to meet her. Will, will amygdala care? Yeah, it does, right? It's a complicated, amygdala, different parts of amygdala are different things, but suffice it to say, amygdala is most interested in the person who is insulting you, kind of interested in the one who was saying nice things about you, and then both of those greater than someone who's neutral. But what's important here is that this tells you something else about amygdala, amygdala's role in anxious responses to social situations. Amygdala can't read, okay? <laughs> so this has to be cortical. This has to be the exact opposite of what I've been talking to you about all night. This is explicit. This is cortex telling amygdala that person's not our friend, okay? Now amygdala's grabbing on to that CS, that conditioned stimulus. But this tells you that anxiety, amygdala can get dragged in in two directions. So some that anxiety disorders are going to be about an amygdala where that's the problem. It's too powerful. It's bottom up, intruding on the cortex, and you're not getting your work done. Okay? That's PTSD and panic disorder. But other anxiety disorders, they start with the cognitions. They start with the thoughts. They start with the thinking. Obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, these are going to be very different. They're going to be disorders where the cortex is reaching down, grabbing amygdala, sucking it in. Once the anxious responding gets going, you're not going to be able to tell them apart. But I think for those of us trying to differentiate these disorders, we're, we're, we're attacking panic and PTSD from an amygdala problem and GAD and OCD from a prefrontal problem. Okay, so the other thing... You know, I used to do Pavlovian conditioning, which is you just, you play a tone and you give an animal juice, or you play a tone and you give an animal a mild shock, and they learn ab about the tone. They, they learn the tone predicts important things. That's how we learned about amygdala. Now that I'm doing humans, I hope you can see this is just Pavlovian conditioning. Okay, that's a tone, and that's the shock. And the system is, is learning in a more human and social way. And since now I'm a human scientist, and my old animal scientist friends don't talk to me anymore, I think I'm going to take this paradigm and bring it back to the animal lab, and I'm pretty sure that'll work. Okay. okay, I know it's not funny, but it took me like two hours to make that slide. So I'm never giving up this joke, okay, ever. 
My secretary tells me that it would be funnier if I made the word long short, but I don't know what she means, and I'm not going to do it. Okay? <laughs> and this slide is a place where um, I can stop and see where we're at and do some questions. And Hey, I don't have to be in Logan until like 10. I'll stay. <laughs> so anybody got any questions? Yeah, we have a couple of microphones that I'll bring around. Hi. What effect do drugs have on the amygdala? So when you're taking a drug like a... So, you know, there's, there's two different... Well, there's lots of drug classes you can take. So think, I'll just stay with what I know, and that's anxiety disorders. But an interesting thing is the same drugs that are prescribed for depression are the, are the same drugs that are described for anxiety. And that tells you how little we know <laughs> about these disorders and their comorbidity and what they have in common and what, what's different. But one thing I can say, you know, I told you we're going to have these kids come back in and do cognitive behavioral therapy, and I'm going to see if it changes the, the strength of their white matter connections. Okay? A drug's not going to do that. Right? It's not gonna, wouldn't give you a drug until you're 50 and it's not possibly going to affect a plastic change in the brain like that. A, a, a drug is a beautiful thing. They, 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 they're a patch, though, right? They're not going to teach you to, to recruit your prefrontal cortex, where I believe cognitive behavioral therapy will. But what the drugs do, and I believe them to be very important, and we all know that what works best is taking drugs and doing CBT at the same time, because what the drug does is it lifts your mood. And now you're on the playing field with us. Now you're willing to get out of bed and go to your therapy appointments and do the homework. And, Right? That's, what, that's the beauty of an SSRI. Another drug would be like a benzodiazepine, so like Valium. That's a very different thing. Now that's if you're having a really, really bad day. Okay? And you just really need to come down. And you're just not, you know, you can talk to yourself until you're blue in the face today and it's not going to work. Valium now, that's something totally different. That's the number one transmitter in the brain is called GABA. And it turns out it's inhibitory. So most what the brain, most what the brain does on a moment to moment basis is inhibit other parts of the brain. Gabber, the amygdala is full of GABA receptors, and when you take Valium, you are basically just shutting amygdala down artificially. Again, that's never going to teach a prefrontal cortex to do this, but if you're having a really bad day and this works for you, more power to you. Um, we just finished a study where we showed people, there were people who were just about to start their SSRIs. They have generalized anxiety disorder. They had never taken an SSRI in their life. We threw them in a brain scanner and showed them the fear faces and then sent them home, let them, and had their separate doctors treat them. And, when, and then we got them back eight weeks later, and all we asked was, um, how much did their anxiety drop? So all these people had really high anxiety scores on these scales. And something happened that I could have told you was going to happen before. Two-thirds of them got better, because that's how about two-thirds of people get some relief from SSRIs. And a third of them didn't get better. And the problem with SSRIs is we never know who's going to be who. And somebody's going to lose two years trying different dosages and different SSRIs. We were able to predict with 85% accuracy based on if we got a prefrontal response to the fear faces, who the drugs were going to work for. Okay? Now, that was one substance for one group in one city at one dosage. So we're now not anywhere near, but where we'd like to be in 20 years is to have an insurance company pay $450 for a brain scan if it's going to tell us something about what's going to work best for you, and we can save you a year and a half of, of, of messing around with different treatments. What else? Your, your experiment indicated that the eyes were very important. Uh, what happened when you blocked out everything but the mouth? Yeah, so I haven't done that experiment. So we, we went after the eyes because, well, I, I think we did it because um, we do eye tracking. So we know where you're looking when, we, when the faces come up. And so if there's a crosshair on the screen and there's no face there and suddenly there's a face, the first thing you do is you, you look at the eyes. That's what we all do. That's the, that's the natural automatic response. And you need an amygdala to do that. People who have damaged amygdalas don't do that. And so did children with autism. So before you jump to amygdala equals autism, let me back up and say, it, amygdala has something to do with prompting your eyes to look at the eyes of others in social situations so you can be so you can learn better okay and that's part of the deficit in autism so but there's you know the, autism is a pervasive developmental disorder there's a language deficit there's a motor component um, but for the eye gaze issue amygdala is going to going to factor um pretty big i have a nephew who's uh seven now and he has autism and um 
all, this, all the games we played with him when he was two were to get him to look at the eyes of other people or pictures on the web, which he did not want to do. But what he liked to do was color name. What? Color name. He walked around the house and named the color of everything. Oh. He'd be naming shirts and the color of this and the color of that. And just, that's, he just loved the color name. So we just said, okay, fine. We came up with a little book of pictures for him. First pictures that didn't have faces. Um, and had him color name and that eventually we worked up to pictures of faces. And what we did is, like, like the contact lens commercials, we just changed the color of the eyes. And he had to start to, to play the color naming game, he had to look at the eyes, right? And so um, that, a, a, a trick like that's only gonna work in a two-year-old, a 10-year-old, a child with autism, not gonna do that for you. But those are the types of things you try to do with children with autism, to get them to engage the eyes because there is some deficit and they're not, they don't naturally engage with the eyes. To answer your excellent question, which I didn't do, um, <laughs> other parts you get, the, the brain's gonna use all the information you give it. So even though I can do a contrived experiment where I can get rid of everything on the face and show you the eyes can be important for the amygdala, when the whole brain gets eyes and mouth, it's going to use that information. The only way you can discriminate a fearful face from a surprised face is the mouth, because the mouth is open and surprised and, and closed in fear. And so the eyes, it, it's very difficult, so when we block just give it a half top, top half of faces that are surprised and fearful, you're at, people are at chance, they can't tell them apart. If I just show you the bottom of surprised and fear faces, we're at 100%. So the mouth is very important. Somebody could run a, the exact same study just looking at if, the, if there's dedicated processing for, for, for the mouth too. I just haven't done it. <laughs> yep. Thank you, this has been wonderful. Um, so many questions, so we'll time. Uh, let me ask two quick amygdala questions, one of which is how ancient is the amygdala in the sense that obviously if you were doing rabbits, it must go back to the mammal brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, I, I, I'm not going to be able to, it's very old. It's one of the old, how, how, how ancient is the amygdala? Um, it's, it doesn't have any layers. So your cortex has six layers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that tell, it's, so we call that just straight gray matter. So that tells you it's one of the oldest areas in the brain. There's, there's other ones, you know, and if anything, the brainstem is going to be even older. So lizards, Lizard, uh, lizards do have an amygdala. Yeah, so it, it, it goes way back. <laughs> and is there any functional difference between the left and the right amygdala? Uh, not that anyone has shown to, in any useful way. So if you lost one... If you, that, you that, that's an excellent point. When you get a patient who has had brain damage and you have bilateral amygdala lesions, you see deficits. If they have just one of them, they're fine. Wow. So you just need one. People ask the question, why, are there, why would there be two of anything? And the best answer that neuroscientists didn't come up with in case you hit your head and lose that one, you got this one. I mean, there's really no better answer than I'm aware of. It's not like a language side, well, as, so, as it is in the upper part. So, la so there are things where the hemispheres make big differences. Right. Language is one of them. Right. So I I'll, say, I'll give an example then. If the, if the language system is dominant on this side, then when you can speak to yourself about something, you're going to see more left amygdala activation. If I show you something ambiguous you can't put into words yet, you're going to see more right amygdala activation. So I can see, you know, we can see games like that, but that's not a difference in the amygdala, that's a difference in how amygdala is interacting with what the cortex is doing. So lateralization is a huge thing for cortical structures. It's not so big for, for gray matter structures. Yep. Yep. Oh, wait a second, you need a microphone. So. I'm interested in knowing how long you've been doing this kind of research at it's Mass General, did you say? Yeah. Um, I started in Mass General at 95. With the extreme anxiety with a combination of the cognitive therapy and the medication. And how successful are you in helping people? Um, so I work on the, um, does everybody hear the question? How long has, has this been going on where people are actually working with the patient groups and, and looking at dr drugs versus um, SSRIs? So I've been doing the research stuff um, since 95, because fMRI, this signal, by the way, MRI was in, invented in the 50s, but um, fMRI was invented in 1992. So this is why we look like little children running around looking at these pictures. It's still really new to us. Um, so th this patient work is ongoing, and the best answer I can give you is that uh, we have no definitive answers yet, but uh, some of the smartest people in the world, guy, see, I, I collaborate on the patient stuff. So this is really the work of Scott Rausch and Lisa Shin, who are at McLean Hospital and Tufts, actually, but we do the work at Mass General uh, because that's where the patients are. Um, I would say it to you this way. The patients find it therapeutic 
to volunteer for these studies. Um, and anyone who volunteers for our research studies also gets treatment. It's part of the deal. If you're going to come and get a brain scanner for us, we're, we're going we're to get, we're going to treat you. Um, so it's 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 symbiotic, and they all tell us that they get they get a lot out of it. They they just talking to us um, helps them just. That's why I said, and that's why I had that quote, just understanding what's going on in between your ears when these things are happening to you. It's just, it's cathartic, it's therapeutic. And so they tell us it's helpful. Have we had any big breakthroughs? No. Is that one study where we can predict who a drug's going to work for a, a really nice beginning? Yes. And that's, you know, we're, we're running down that alley. But Im immediately what we're doing is comparing that to CBT. We have those same findings for CBT, by the way. Show your fear faces, then do the CBT. Sorry, cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy which you have to do in addition to your drug therapy. It's the only way it works. Um, I was wondering how um, you would test somebody who is blind. <laughs> um, I would scream in their left ear <laughs> and then compare it to the right. <laughs> um, so it, have you ever heard of blind sight? I've heard of it, but the person I know has no sight at all. Okay, but um, they... I told you how the brain's laid out, though. Visual information's coming in, and amygdala's reacting, even if you can't explicitly tell me what we're dealing with yet, right? Uh, well, this person uh, had a tumor, brain tumor, so there's no, there's no nothing there. Yeah, so there, it, it, it's very dependent on the exact type of damage to the visual system, but I'll just give you one interesting case. There's, a, there's something called blind sight, and so this would be an example called emotional blind sight, okay? Some people are blind, but if you um, tell, just say to them, I'm, I'm holding a, a, a ball in one of my hands, which hand is it? Some of them can guess, you know, and, and, if, you, know, and you have an actual ball in one of your hands. Um, even though they can't see it, some of them they can guess above chance which hand it's in. Okay? Like, so they shouldn't be able to do that. When you, when you throw facial expressions up on a screen for some blind patients, they can guess when the fear faces are up better than the other expressions. That tells you amygdala is activating in them. They're getting an inkling in their body mm. about the presence of something, okay? So it's, it's, called, it's, very, it's called blind sight. It's very, it's very interesting. So it happens, it's, very, it's rare, but it's, it happens. What else? Okay, yeah, there, there was a guy back here, right? Who was waiting? Somebody uh, was. You indicated that when the oxygen concentration changed that it influenced the hydrogen resonance. Yeah. Why did the oxygen concentration change? Because the because it, because the cells utilized it. So you've you've got it. And I'm not I'm not a physicist expert, but you've got a local blood supply around these neurons. They that they you know you know what a stroke is. You have to get them blood because you have to get cells oxygen. When cells become more active, they have a greater they a greater need for oxygen. So they actually extract more oxygen from the local blood supply. So for a split second, in that same capillary bed. You can say vessel if you want, but capillary bed is what it is. There's going to be a little region of what we call deoxygenated hemoglobin instead of oxygenated, and the hydrogen particles move differently for those two states, and we can see it. So it's we're we're seeing a, a usage and they call it oxygen extraction. You're actually basically just seeing when oxygen is getting extracted from the blood supply, and the hydrogen behaves differently. What were the conditions you said? started in the prefrontal cortex rather than yeah well it's just it's th that's the, just a, that, the emotional yeah, disorder that's pure something. speculation but um an idea that scott rush and i are trying to tackle right now is that obsessive compulsive disorder in gad might be better thought of as thought anxiety disorders where the thinking G -A -G? i'm sorry i'm sorry gad generalized anxiety disorder oh, general. okay that's like um oh i don't know me it's like somebody who can lose four hours on a couch like nobody's business, just not really free, free we call it free floating anxiety. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you, you're thinking about nine things at once, but you're not really thinking about any one thing. And it's just this, this fog of anxiousness that's kind of just taking you out of your day. That's GAD. Okay. And that doesn't feel to us like a bottom up amygdala thing. It feels like you going and getting your amygdala and ruining your own day. <laughs> <laughs> And we're not blaming you for that, saying it's how you're built, and so you have to learn how to get yourself out of that. And then so panic disorder and PTSD, those would be the ones we think of as... You're welcome. Way, way in the back. 
When you go into that place where you sit on the couch for four <laughs> hours and you go to get grab your own, own yep. thing to then flush it down the toilet for a little <laughs> while, do you find it helpful to massage your cranium in the locations where the little almonds <laughs> seem to be? I don't know about that. The, the massage would probably help. Um, I don't know about um, a location. Um, again, I'm not a clinician. I'm, I'm just the researcher. But you know what the, what the clinicians tell our GAD patients to do is to compartmentalize their worry. So set an alarm for 20 minutes and sit on the couch and go crazy, have fun with it. And then when the alarm goes off, though, you have to have had a plan and you have to go do what you said you were going to do. Okay? And actually, it works um, pretty effectively. I don't know about massage, but what I do know about is um, motor movements. Um, so that's striatum. It's sitting in the middle of your head. And it, what does it do? It does automatic motor programs. And so what do, what do children with autism do when they get anxious? Mm -hmm. they, right? They're, you are back channeling your, you are trying to soothe yourself from within. You are also establishing control over the situation. You know what you're going to be doing for the next 30 minutes. Okay? So it's important. But when I go to give an exam in a classroom, right? I walk into the classroom. They're all in their seats. That never happens. They're there so they can study five minutes early, right before I hand them the piece of paper. But when I look around at a room of 35 kids, everybody's moving. And there's not one kid in that room that's sitting still. Somebody's doing this with their hair. Somebody's doing this with a pencil. The knee under the desk is a big one. Everyone. Has, an, has a soothing motor program they go to when they're trying to soothe themselves. And when you think of OCD and you think of autism and the most stereotype behavior, that's all, this is just this in a very extreme example, right? It's just gotten out of control. But it's the same thing. You do it, they do it. It's nothing new. It just looks a little bit more complex. What's that? Oh, but I'm talking about all of us. So we all do that. Oh, these kids, they're 20 year olds, they're college students. Yeah, really bratty college students. <laughs> no, actually, Dartmouth kids are really nice. I found that um, working with seventh and eighth graders was a very interesting thing to do because I I wasn't trained to teach them how to read or anything like that, but. Seventh and eighth graders have not yet moved to being sophomores and senior or juniors in high school, where they now know that they know everything. <laughs> they don't know at seventh and eighth grade everything, and they're fascinating <laughs> to work with. Really, I, I mean, you. I did it for thirty years. I believe you. Yeah, and and you could. It, it didn't matter how skillful they were, because. You could get to them through words if you read to them. Right. And I found that extraordinary, you know, responses. But when you were talking about taking the exam or writing, it was fun to watch the different body. Yeah, and they all have a different strategy. Yeah. Right. But I also found that kids at that age respond to being read to. Oh, that's good to know. It, it's, just be interesting to, to, to think about in terms of what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing there'd be lots of categories of soothing things mm -hmm. you could do in that situation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what the amygdala is doing during various states of sleep. Um, it, it should be reacting as if it has no idea you're asleep, be my guess. Right? Should have no idea you're asleep, right? So the reason you, you know you're paralyzed when you're in, in REM anyway, right? Mostly paralyzed. Um, so that you don't act out your dreams. And you know there are disorders where people don't do that and they quite dangerously act out their dreams. But if that's the way the system's built, then that explains why our dreams feel so realistic and why we, we don't really have as-if experiences. We kinda, <laughs> you're kind of all in in REM sleep anyway. And so that, to me, would suggest Amygdala is learning in those situations as well and trying to figure out what, what to do next to protect you. It just doesn't know that you're not actually in danger. That would be my guess. Suggestions for further reading. Suggestions for further reading. Um, my book. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, you don't want to read that book. You want to read the book I'm writing right now, which is called The Uncertainty of It All. It should be done. 
It's called The Uncertainty of It All, and it should be done, well, I was supposed to have it done in August. It's not done. Um, and so I would guess, it, it, I, might, I would guess it's going to be out in about a year. But it's basically a lot of this um, stuff, and it's, it's written for you, uh, it's written for everybody, it's written for my students, so it's written at, at this level, um, which is a good level. It's, uh, amygdala doesn't have anything, any, anything to do with that, that, that feeling, so it, it can happen. So your, your body get, is paralyzed on purpose when you're sleeping, and some of us, when we wake, that process isn't quite over yet, and so you ha you, you're there for a second, and it, be, it can be quite uh, upsetting um, for, if you don't know what's happening. But it's, that's, I would call that a normal variant. That happens in some people, and, and as long as you're snapping out of it you know, really quickly, it's, it's not an issue. But that wouldn't be an amygdala thing. That's a total brainstem thing. It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> yes? What, what kinds of things can damage the amygdala other than a, a blunt blower rod? Through yeah, the um, actually, it's, it, 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 amygdala is well cased. It's actually very difficult to damage the amygdala with some sort of um, trauma. So actually, these patients that I'm telling you about, uh, it, it, it's unbelievable. It's a disorder called urbach vitat syndrome. That's the last name of two German guys who uh, first wrote about it. It's a, it's a dermatological condition. The skin calcifies. And for reasons that no one knows, the vocal cords calcify. In fact, these kids are usually 20 years old when they report and they're, they're, they're losing their voice, like for real, because their vocal cords are hardening. And their amygdala calcifies bilaterally and nothing else. The rest of their brain is 100% intact. There's only been 300 cases ever known. There's only probably 10 of these people on the planet right now. It's very rare. Um, you, it, the question was, how, do they, how does it present? Given all that I've talked about tonight, about the amygdala and how much I care about it, you would think that I would now tell you, you know, they're just devastated, right? And there's no quality of life. Uh, no, they're fine. I think they'd be sitting right here with us, and we would, we'd have no idea. Um, the only way you can see these deficits is you, um, you show them the fa all the facial expressions. They have no problem with all the others, but they have problems labeling fear. And then they have an even greater problem when you say, okay, you said that guy was afraid on a scale from one to ten, how afraid does that guy look? You saw those pictures, they're caricatures, they're, they're very big expressions, they're fake. Everybody in this room would, would say, I don't know, six, seven, eight. Someone with a bilateral amygdala lesion says two, one. So that thing that the eye widening is supposed to be, that, that message that's supposed to be getting through and impacting you isn't getting through, but as we just covered with the eye scanning, People with amygdala lesions don't look to the eyes. And if you then take this patient and say, okay, 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 a face is coming now, look at the eyes. They do it, and then you ask them how afraid is that person, and they say, eight. They're cured. So you have to think about that then. You, the, the experimenter is become, the doctor's becoming the amygdala for the person. This is what your amygdala does to you. It tells you to look where you looked last time, where you learned well. And on faces, that's the eye region. And amygdala does this for you if you're in a room, if, I, if this was a cage and I was shocking you, which I'm apt to do, and, a light, <laughs> and if a light was going off every time in that corner, okay, if you had an amygdala, you would be orienting your attention randomly at first, and then by the third trial, you're, you're going to be turned this way. Rats without amygdalas continue to orient their attention randomly. They, they just don't pick up, they don't look where there's good, get, good information. They don't, know to, they don't keep going back to where they got good information. In this case, the corner of the room, on a face it would be the eyes. But it's the same game. It's just a location where you learn stuff. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ram. Thank you, Jack.